Good afternoon and welcome to the webcast for the Ned Group Investments Global Flexible Fund. I'm Mahini Naidu of Ned Group Investments and it is my absolute pleasure today to welcome Steve Romick and Brian Selmo of FPA to join us in conversation about how they manage the portfolio. The Global Flexible Fund is a fully flexible portfolio with a go-anywhere mandate in which the manager aims to deliver an equity-like return over the long term while taking less risk than the stock market. FBA have managed the portfolio since 2013, but have an almost three decade track record at their in managing their contrarian value strategy on which the Global Flexible Fund is modeled. They've picked up multiple industry and team awards along the way, and Ned Group Investments is very proud of our partnership with them. We will hear from Steve and Brian today about how they have had to adapt to the continually changing landscape and what it means to be a contrarian value investor in today's fast moving environment. Steve, welcome. And thank you very much thank for joining you. us today. Thanks, Mo. Is, is that your home office that you're dialing in from? Or are you guys back at office in LA? So this is my home office. If you hear dogs or children, I've, I've told them to please try and be quiet, but we're, we never know for sure that's going to work out. They are the stock market is unpredictable. It is, I think, is uh, outweighed by the unpredictability of my children. Absolutely, I was told in no uncertain terms to come into the office, so there's no children, <laughs> no dogs allowed with me. <laughs> Steve, it's a, a great pleasure to have you with us today. You're the founding member of the Contrarian Value Strategy. You've been managing it for almost three decades. Can you tell us what the Contrarian Value Strategy is all about? What are some of the underlying investment principles? I guess we just start with a definition of, of, of contrarian value, which to us means that when we buy something that we're getting more than what we paid for it. That, me, that, me, that might be because you know, a good business is facing a cyclical challenge or maybe investors don't fully recognize the quality of that business. Either way, owning such a mispriced asset should you know translate into a rate of return that is better than a market as a whole and the way we've expressed this throughout through the portfolio is through both through equities and through corporate debt thank you so you describe yourself as the strategy is called contrarian value can you tell us or help us to understand where that falls in the spectrum of the more traditional styles of growth and value and how important is it for you to define yourself in either one of those categories? We, we, we are often labeled value investors, but we want to be careful of, of such pigeonholing. And so the importance of, of the label, you know, I should kind of you know, walk through just kind of how we think about, you know, this blurry line that divides growth and value. People tend to think of value investing as owning the shares of a proven business and frequently cyclical industries that don't have much growth, while considering growth stocks to be those shares of businesses that can seemingly grow at a healthy clip for, for years to come and have less economic cyclicality. We want to own growing businesses. We want to own them and buy them at a price that can offer a margin of safety that protects our capital in the event that all doesn't exactly go as planned. Traditionally, that protection has come had come from a, 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 a company's balance sheet that is you know, buying below book value, for example, or maybe getting some un unrecognized real estate value or some other hidden asset. But blindly practicing this time-honored value investing is dangerous, particularly today, as many of those types of companies have been disrupted by some of the most prolific technological innovations the world has ever seen. I mean, the internet, you know, for example, wasn't, you know, a thing when I started out in the mid 80s, at least as far as it touching my world, more maybe in the US Department of Defense, but it's allowed for retail sales to move from brick and mortar you know, to the web, driving more than a few companies into bankruptcy. Digitally available music has largely replaced its physical consumption, changing the economics for a host of the industry participants, including retailers and record labels, while introducing the likes of Spotify and other streamers. Other changes like cloud storage replacing your local hard drive, cell phones displacing landlines, uh, accelerated drug development, electric vehicles, new forms of banking, you know, and so on and so forth, has allowed so many new entrants to quickly dominate you know, the vanguard. You know, the old guard, I mean, sorry. Uh, some companies like Walmart have adapted, others like, like Sears haven't, despite at one point 
think of it from a value investing construct, having a huge store of value in the real estate they own for a half century or more. Right, so you're looking at the environment in which you're operating and your principles remain steadfast, but you're not anchored to a very narrow definition of what value investing is. You're evolving over time and you're adapting as the landscape and the environment changes. Sure, if we didn't involve and recognize that a margin of safety could be established by understanding and properly valuing a business and not just its balance sheet, we, we don't feel we'd have a lot to offer you know, our investors today. Our job is to understand what changes are likely down the road, who will win and who will lose. It's as important to avoid those losers as it is to find those winners. But it's also important to avoid overpaying even for a really great company. A winning business doesn't necessarily translate into a winning stock. Microsoft's stock, for example, was lower in 2009 than it was in 1999, even though it delivered high teens growth along the way. Price matters, and that's one thing that won't ever change for us. Great. So what kind of return, risk return profile can an investor in the Global Flexible Fund expect? And in what kind of markets do you expect your strategy to out or underperform? We, we expect that the fund would underperform in markets where, where price doesn't matter, particularly those you know characterized by great faith on what might be, but is yet to be proven. Those businesses that where you know aren't earning money today, but people expect them to be in 10 years earning X, Y, or Z. But it, it, the business models are still untested. And we've seen a lot of that in recent years and, and such better in the common, you know, as a, as a good proxy for what's going on, you know, has given rise to the U.S. SPAC phenomenon, which, which in the last 15 months, $175 billion has been raised in 15 months for these blank check companies who have raised money to buy some unnamed company at some unnamed price. The fund should outperform, though, in those periods where an industry group or an asset class falls from grace. We could do well by avoiding some of the weaknesses as price fall and possibly do well again by picking up you know some inexpensive good assets you know businesses corporate debt etc steve those are some quite mind-boggling numbers to wrap to wrap one's head around now going back to we've talked about you have a, a track record spending multiple decades so you've experienced the asian crisis of 97 the dot-com bubble 9-11 Grexit, Brexit, and more recently, um, the global pandemic unleashed across across the world. So, how how have you and the team adapted to this continually evolving environment? Well, I mean, the world's always changing, and I mean, it's, it's forever going to be the case. That's been the, in the course of history. And that's going to be in you know, the future. And it's very important to separate what is cyclical change from what is secular change. I mean, in this case, we're really living through an environment where, where a global pandemic has stopped, you know, many you know businesses in their tracks. I mean, no less so than those in the cyclical travel industry. I don't know of any hotel owners that underwrote their their businesses, their properties, in their downside case to a zero percent occupancy, and that has driven some industry participants into bankruptcy. I mean, similarly, staying on that, that travel theme, similarly impacted were travel agents, aircraft suppliers, aircraft leasing companies, airlines, and, and car rental companies. Most of these businesses will bounce back. People will once again travel, and it's already beginning to happen. But in the spring of 2020, that seemed a remote possibility to those investors who were feel, fearfully selling their, their shares. So yes, the world's going to change, and, but it's important to, again, identify what is secular, what is cyclical. So much of what's happened in the last year has been cyclical. And secularly, of course, in the last year, there have been many businesses that have benefited. Advertising was already moving online, but it shift accelerated in the last year, you know, benefiting a host of, a host of companies. Uh, video streaming was already growing quickly before the pandemic and has taken even more share from traditional media as people have been forced to find ways to entertain themselves at home at the expense of movie theaters, broadcast television, and cable networks. Um, and there are businesses today that no longer exist. I mean, I mentioned Sears. You know, that in the U.S. has gone after 120 Sears. You can go across the pond and see Thomas Cook in the U.K. no longer exist after 178 years. Both face cyclical and secular challenges. And we are constantly forced to examine what businesses are more likely to thrive 
a decade from now, and those that could be shuttered. Note that I'm speaking about the businesses and not the stock prices, which are a secondary consideration. It's incumbent upon us, you know, as, as your portfolio managers, to analyze what changes are taking place in and around the industry that might either benefit it or, or harm the underlying participants. We begin with trying to understand, though, with which companies will be good or better a decade from now. And thinking with that, with that mindset and thinking down the road allows us to, forces us to, continually to adapt to, you know, the expected changes that are, that are going to come. So we always are analyzing, you know, the real time factors that are, that are drivers in the marketplace. And will 5G be an impact to, to cable or not, you know, et cetera. Steve, you mentioned looking out a decade at the companies that are going to be around potentially in the decade or going to struggle to survive the next decade. Now, I know that macro forecasting is not what FPA do, but looking out the next decade, what is it that concerns you and what gives you hope for the next decade? Well, let's start with the, the hopes, right? Let's start, you know, um, well, no, let me start with the concerns. We'll end on the optimistic notes. The concerns are, I mean, interest rates are at thousand year lows and most people, you know, I know have never seen rates rise. I mean, since I've been in business, I've only seen interest rates go down and lower rates increase equity values, you know, everywhere. Higher, all else equal. Higher rates, lower, conversely, lower equity values and debt values, all else equal. You know, another, you know, concern is inflation has been benign for years. We, we wonder if all the unfettered sovereign borrowing you know, uh, to spend, you know, there might not be some inflation down the road. And if so, what that might look like uh, and how will interest rates respond to that? How will the economies respond? What kind of pricing power will these companies, you know, be able to have such that they'll be able to restate, retain, you know, uh, sustain margins, uh, continue to generate, you know, good free cash flow and, 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 and maintain a certain return level of return in capital. But we're starting at a place today where valuations aren't cheap. And we are dependent on low rates and good earnings growth. Should one or the other change, there could be some market volatility. But on the other side of the coin, you know, to end more optimistically, you know, this question is is a a, a post-pandemic rebound, economic rebound is is upon us. It's already happening. And the you know, society is resilient. We've seen bad economies come and go, and companies and investors have adapted and survived. We have now lived through a pandemic. It takes a lot to get us down, all of us collectively. You know, low rates and easy money, as I said, are a concern, but there's not a lot that seems likely to change, you know, on that front in the foreseeable future. And again, I want to, you know, highlight the statement you made that we're not, you know, uh, you know ma great macro thinkers, but we just always think on the, on the, on the, in the foreseeable future, we see, you know, governments, you know, and their incentive to keep rates as low as possible, the continued desire to spend. And therefore, that might, you know, continue to provide supports, if not even fuel for this market. Thank you very much, Steve. Appreciate your time today and for sharing your learnings and experiences from the last three decades with us. Is that a guitar in the corner of your room? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah. Do you play? I'm not, I'm not going to play. I'm not going to play that. Come for you. on. <laughs> Our investment performance over 30 years is, is better than my guitar playing over 50 years. <laughs> Let us be the judge of that, but we'll 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 try and we'll try and convince you to do that next time. Thanks very much for joining us, Steve. Thank you. We'll now welcome co-portfolio manager Brian Selmo. Brian joined the firm in 2008 and serves as portfolio manager and director of research of the Contrarian Value Strategy. Brian will be providing us with some insights into how the Contrarian Value philosophy and process is implemented in the portfolio. How does this process actually translate into positions in the portfolio and delivering returns for investors? Brian, welcome. Thanks, Mohini. How nice are you doing? You. Good. Are you, are you also working from home in LA or are you working out of town? I'm, I'm also at home in LA. Okay. So you... And my kids are younger than Steve's and more rambunctious, <laughs> so the same warning applies for me. Well, hopefully it's early enough in the morning for them to still be in bed. <laughs> Although little yeah. kids never stay in bed past five. They're getting, they're, they're, I, I can hear them getting ready for school actually a little bit. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So we'll see. Um, but yeah, thanks for having me. Brian, you're the co-portfolio manager of the Global Flexible Fund and the director of research on the contrarian value strategy. Can you tell us a little bit about how this go anywhere mandate works in the team? How does the team interact with each other in lockdown? 
who decides who goes yeah. where? Sure. So in terms of working together and organizing ourselves, we have two scheduled meetings a week. One meeting is with the analyst team um, where we review what everyone's working on, make sure people are kind of on task and uh, prioritizing what we want to uh, focus on and that projects are getting done in a timely fashion. The other meeting is with the three portfolio managers and there we're discussing uh, more portfolio oriented um, or you know, business oriented issues. And those two meetings really touches service touchstones. Um, most of the work happens uh, on an individual basis or on an ad hoc basis where it's either one or two analysts or a small team working on a project. And when you think about what we're doing from a research um, side, there's kind of two continuous processes that are going on. And I think Steve alluded to this a little bit in his discussion. You know, we want to identify and follow high quality franchise businesses. Usually they line up in industries. So we have analysts that have you know, sort of focused in industries where we think they're likely to, or there are currently, you know, investments or high quality businesses that we want to be familiar with on a global basis. And so we follow those with the hope of being ready to go um, if or when something goes wrong. And I think that the pandemic certainly highlights for us the, uh, you know, sort of wisdom of that approach because when everything is going wrong it's very very difficult if not impossible to get up to speed and wrap your head around a new situation it's much easier to go back to something that you've spent years paying attention to and see that uh you know that's now at a price that you're interested in buying the other thing that we do on a continuous basis is look for you know, one-off situations or commercial opportunities. These we think of as like running towards fires or disasters. These are businesses that are, you know, absolutely sustainable, have a viable future. You know, we're, we're not looking to do the sort of, uh, you know, structurally challenged businesses, but they're companies that aren't as high quality, that aren't quite as good a franchise. And so those were really buying almost exclusively on price. And it's a matter of them being, you know, too cheap for what they are. So those are the two things the team's working on at any time. Thanks. You mentioned that you have structured meetings with the analysts and specifically scheduled meetings with the portfolio managers, but how has lockdown and working from home and working remotely impacted the team dynamic? Have you been able to pull together as a cohesive team um, from re remote locations or how has that actually panned out? Yeah, it's actually planned out uh, very well and, and better than I would have guessed if you'd have told me 18 months ago that uh, last March we were all going to go home and really not see each other in person for a year. You know, our, our sort of platform of choice is Microsoft Teams and that's been a very uh, useful way for us all to communicate and we still have the same, you know, weekly meetings that now happen over Teams. Now, I tend to not use the video feature of Teams. Uh, other people on the, on the team like to use the video feature, but you know, that's, that's sort of a personal choice. But I think if anything, we've learned that we can be pretty effective remote. And I think like a lot of companies or businesses, we'll probably you know, evaluate what the office needs and sort of the cadence of that looks like in the future. I would suspect that we'll have a couple of days a week at least where everyone comes in the office, but there'll probably be a lot more flexibility, which I would guess that you and many of our listeners are thinking about for themselves too. Absolutely. We've gone through a very similar situation in South Africa where, well, at Net Group Investments, where I have historically not been a big fan of the video feature, but we re very recently developed a framework where we've said, okay, here are some guidelines for us all to operate in so that, you know, we have a similar foundation. Right. Um, so yeah, it means no more team meetings in my pajamas. <laughs> but other than that, it's right. working quite, <laughs> it's working quite well. <laughs> Brian, going back to Steve's earlier comments, um, how has the evolution- We haven't gotten to that point yet. <laughs> We well, still have some pajama meetings, I think. I'm very pleased you've made an effort for us today. I like the, <laughs> yeah. I like the kit. You're welcome. Going back to yeah. Steve's earlier comments, can you give us some insights into how the evolution of the strategy has played out in the portfolio and some of the positions you hold? Are there perhaps sectors or businesses or industries that you've been more active in in recent years relative to history? Absolutely. I think there's a couple of key points that Steve made. I think one is that, you know, price matters and a margin of safety matters. And so that's a 
framework and an intellectual approach that we're going to apply to an individual company as well as the portfolio at large. And so I think that's something that's evergreen and sort of underpins any sort of sensible investing. I think the other thing that you're getting at, maybe Steve talked about, is that, you know, the world has changed a lot, um, you know, in the last 15 years. The fact that we can do this call seamlessly across the globe is new in the last five years, probably. Um, certainly at the cost we're able to do it. And so I think that as people looking to invest capital, protect it and deploy it, you have to be continuously learning and respectful of what's going on in the world. So there are a number of businesses that we own in the digital space. If you think about some of the internet platform companies, for instance, uh, that didn't exist really as scale businesses 15 or 20 years ago. And today they, as long as along with many others, are, are really among the best businesses uh, when you think about it from a return on capital perspective, or if you think about businesses that have zero marginal cost and in some cases zero cost to acquire a customer, you know, those are business models that are, they're, I, I, I hesitate to say, you know, they're, they're ideal almost, I don't want to say perfect, but they're ideal business models, right? Where, you know, incrementally you generate revenue and, and profit without, you know, expending any, you know, economic, uh, you know, effort, let's say, and, and that all falls to the bottom line. And so those type of businesses need to be, you know, considered through, uh, you know, the, the eye of how they operate. And, and we've always done that. Uh, you know, we've considered banks and financials differently than the way we would consider a medical device company. For instance, we look at different metrics, we look at different margins, we look at different, um, you know, drivers through the financial statements uh, to think about the value or to think about signposts. And that will continue to evolve, I think, also, as Steve said. So I think it's a matter of, of us observing and participating in what's a you know, dynamic world. And it will, you know, I think, continue to be dynamic. Mm. If, if we look at the portfolio today, Brian, there may be positions in the fund that some would question as being value investments in the traditional sense of the word. So maybe the IT sector or the consumer services sector would be a good example of this in the portfolio sure. currently. How would you reconcile some of these positions in the portfolio with your with your value approach, with your contrarian value approach? Yeah, I, I think the first thing that someone has to do is, is that you have to accept that different businesses have different fundamental economic characteristics and ought to trade and be valued on, on different uh, numbers than say, you know, company X. And so I, and I, I, th I think you could look at this, whether it's in, uh, you know, more traditional companies like a bank compared to say a medical company or a consumer service uh, or a consumer staple company, right? They're going to, you're going to pay attention to different things in each of those. And they're going to, you know, what, what is a margin of safety or cheap in one is going to look very different in terms of metrics of balance sheet multiples or income statement multiples than the other. I think the same is true for, uh, you know, digital businesses. And I think I mentioned the, you know, some of the aspects where you have, you know, very low or no marginal cost of revenue or customer acquisition. And, and what that means is that things like a uh, totally addressable market or things like scale advantages and, and likelihood of reaching them are a lot more relevant than say what's on the balance sheet um, or even what's maybe in the historic income statement. I mean, there are, some businesses, many businesses that have winner take all or winner take most features. And if, if a company in that type of business has recently, let's say, won the market or become the winner taking most, you know, the fact that two years ago they didn't make any money is sort of irrelevant to their prospects of T plus five, which is really where, where one wants to keep their head when thinking about a business. I mean, you know, five years from now with T plus five. And that's because, you know, the balance sheet and the income statement, that sort of reflects everything you know about the past or what you can know about the past. But whatever your result or experience as an investor is going to be is going to be really completely dependent on what happens in the future. So I think you've got to use the financial statements to get a handle on, uh, you know, what you're paying compared to what's happened. But you also want to make sure that you're not um, stuck maybe in a less relevant view of the business or its opportunity. Thanks. Let's rewind a year going back to 2020. And as that first quarter of 2020 unfolded, 
did you find yourself concerned about how you were positioned, some of the names you were in, um, perhaps wondering whether some mistakes might have been made? And how do you retain conviction in the positions that you're in when things are perhaps not fall unfolding the way that you or investors might be expecting in a market downturn? Yeah, I, th I think if we rewind, you know, going into 2020, we would have been, you know, reducing some exposure in the fourth quarter. And I think we would have been down under 60%, probably mid 50s or so invested in equities. Now, a number of our equities performed very poorly in the first quarter, particularly, uh, you know, the financials and, uh, and anything related to aerospace where we had a uh, reasonable exposure also. Um, so, you know, it, it was a scary time, I think, because, you know, we didn't know what the sort of case fatality rate was for the virus or how rapidly it would spread. And so I, I don't want to um, downplay the fact that it was highly uncertain and, and certainly very scary on a health perspective on a personal basis. I think when you look through to the uh, portfolio, you know, there's a couple of things that you stay grounded in. I think one is the underlying um, financials and the competitive positions of the companies you own. And I think that, you know, there were potential for major challenges to balance sheets and uh, and in certainly near term earnings for a lot of companies. But, you know, I don't think we were at that time and not now in a lot of businesses that faced secular challenges or faced competitive disruption because of a shutdown in the economy. So I think that was, you know, sort of easier to be comfortable in. Even if you look at a sector that was really directly hit, like for instance, the aerospace parts suppliers where we had share, we had meaningful position, you know, market share isn't moving around. You know, people didn't suddenly, you know, lose their position on on different plane models. It's just that there was going to be a lot less demand. And so you know, what we did at that time is really refocus our efforts on you know a number of new investments and then adding to other investments that had the characteristic of what we would say is you know when not if so we wanted to kind of take the balance sheet concerns off the table when we were thinking about buying new names or increasing uh, exposures and we wanted to buy businesses that we thought were very strong competitively I'll you know mention a you know a european maybe south african roots favorite such as richemont right been through steve mentioned things have been around for 100 years right you can listen to uh, their quarterly call from first quarter of last year they said hey we've been through two world wars we've been through a pandemic already you know it was my job in running this business is just make sure the lights are still on whenever this ends we'll be fine and that you know that's maybe a bit of an extreme case but those are the kind of businesses we're trying to invest in and if you have spent time following them, as I mentioned before, that we do on the compounders, and you've sort of gotten yourself comfortable that, yeah, they kind of will withstand whatever might come, you don't end up, you know, terribly scared uh, with them or in them. Um, and so, you know, we ended up investing a little bit more and in increasing the exposure um, at that time. I think that if the logic of what you're doing is sound, um, you know, having difficult and you know performance periods is is actually kind of part of what will happen you know it's it's sort of expected unfortunately you never quite know when or why but it will happen and you know if if you're underwritten the businesses in a in a rational and conservative manner you know you'll end up coming out the other end thanks very much brian Looking at the most recent performance to 31 March 2021, we're pleased to see quite a different picture emerging. Do you see this as a validation of the strategy or with the benefit of hindsight, were there things that you think you might have done differently? Yeah, I think two things I'd say, March 21 definitely feels better than March 20 or mm -hmm. April, however it is, whether it's performance or just globally or you know, I think just the a, a lighter feeling in humanity. So I think it's a much better time. Um, but I'm I'm very reluctant to you know take a lot of validation from you know 12 months or a year or something of uh, good performance. And so you know if 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 I'm if I think that the you know the, the strategy is is intellectually sound over time, that's really what I think you know validates it. And then you know we would expect to have good performance over long periods of time. But you know I don't think a tough you know, first quarter of 2020 invalidates the strategy. And I, and so I'm not going to then say that, well, you have a good quarter, a good year, now it validates it. No, I, I think the underlying philosophy is sound. And I think we, you know, over time, Steve, for, you know, even longer, 
you know, has diligently pursued it and sort of demonstrated that it that it works. And so that's what I would rest on for validation, not sort of what's happened in a quarter or two, because I, you know, the second quarter could be terrible. I don't know. And if it is, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to be here in three or four months saying, well, is it invalid now? I, you know, my answer would be, you know, sort of the same, whether things are going well or or badly. You know, in terms of, you know, there's there's a ton of woulda, coulda, shoulda, um, but I think that the that the big takeaway for us and sort of thing that would have surprised um, me if, you know, if we were sitting here a year ago, I think Steve and I both would have said that we would expect to get a fair amount of uh, investments going or exposure committed to high yield and distress. And that really didn't happen. And so I'm both surprised on the one hand that there wasn't a meaningful credit cycle. And then I think, you know, somewhat frustrated and disappointed um, at how invested we were in uh, credit, because it's certainly there was a week or something where it sold off last year before the Fed stepped in. And so I think that in the future, what we've talked about or are learning from that is that we want to act um, more quickly in an instrument that's more liquid. So probably, you know, through an ETF or something. And then over time, as liquidity develops and individual credit names sort of peel out of the say industry position and into individual names. And so that way I think we'll set ourselves up to get the exposure we want, even if the opportunity is very, very brief, we might you know, end up not getting into the individual names, but at least we will have something going. So I think that's something that you know, was, was, is disappointing. And I think we have a plan to improve on that you know, in the future. Thanks, that kind of leads into my final question for you today. Would you like to make any final comments on how the portfolio is positioned today um, regarding your expectations for the next three to five years or longer? How, what are some of the scenarios you're considering, maybe interest rate hikes or economic recovery, so that you're building a resilient portfolio, one that's going to deliver through a full market cycle um, and hopefully protect capital if, if we see continued volatility? Yeah, I, I think that over the last three months or so, it's and, and this isn't sort of a wholesale change, but I think we've been, you know, selling down some of the more cyclical positions, some of the financials that have really come back strongly and trade at very different valuations than they did, you know, six months ago, but even traded at in January of 2020. Um, and we're sort of you know, gradually shifting into things that I think are more defensive in nature in terms of their underlying business profile. Um, and that's that's kind of the, you know, I'll call it the shaping that we're doing in the portfolio right now. I, I echo what Steve said that, you know, valuations generally are pretty high. I don't think that there's sort of any, you know, huge uh, pocket of opportunity where we think there's, you know, big outsized return available. And so with that uh, and the very low starting point for yields, I think that, you know, our expectations would be pretty uh, modest over the next three to five years. I think that it's, uh, you know, you never know how well the businesses will perform or, or the economy, but certainly you're not starting from a depressed level. Um, so, yeah. Brian, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for joining us today and sharing those valuable insights with us and to you and the team. Thank you all for your commitment and dedication in delivering on your investment promises. Have a good day further. Thank you. Get yeah. your kids off to school on time. Day. Yeah, I will. Thanks. Bye. Cheers. So thank you very much to everybody from around the world for joining us today. I think it was a great privilege to be able to have this time with Brian and Steve and to get their, uh, to get their insights directly as to how they've been evolving and adapting to the continually changing landscape. I'd like to read a quote from Steve Romick from a recent um, press release in which he says, we have changed what we are willing to own. We never want to remain stagnant as investors. Technological innovation has secularly harmed many industries while other industries have benefited. As such, we have expanded our horizons and research capabilities and own more tech and internet companies including some in China. And I think for me personally, as an investor in the Global Flexible Fund, it gives me a lot of comfort that one of the, one of the attributes of the FPA investment team is that they're investing alongside of me so that I know they're putting their money where their mouth is. They're not taking undue risks in, 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 in investing my capital and your capital, and that they're trying to deliver on that investment promise, uh, promise of equity-like returns through a full market cycle. 
So once again, thank you very much to all for dialing in today. Um, you'll see a QR code at the end of this session. We value, as always, we value your feedback. If you could please scan the code on the screen to share your views with us. And also just a reminder to please join us next week for our local and global fund manager workshops on Tuesday and Thursday. So on that note, have a good evening, stay safe, stay healthy, and we hope you've given, we've given you a few reasons today to stay invested.